Uh, good morning, Council. Thank this you. is the uh, Governance and Priorities Committee meeting, Tuesday, uh, January 24th. This is uh, uh, Council orientation, and we have an agenda in front of you. Um, I do need to add one item, uh, an in-camera item regarding land and legal advice, uh, which we, uh, we have a motion to close the meeting at the bottom, but with that being entered, I would ask that uh, that be put off. We'll provide further direction uh, at that time. Yes, sir. Can you ask for the uh, address or the property involved? Sure, it's regard to uh, the Alliance Properties address in Northern John. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, your Worship, I have to go to a PCC meeting, um, so I would need to know what time that item is going to be coming up, and if it's going to be added to the agenda. Um, what time's your PCC meeting, sir? Uh, 9.30 to however long it goes, probably 11 or so, no, 11.30. Right. We'll still be here. Um, It'll so, be so when oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Until It'll after, after this. this. I was going to say, we could probably bring it, bring it up lunch. Okay. Given that we're committed to going until 3 o'clock, uh, 4 o'clock today, actually. Okay, so, um, so it won't come up yeah. before noon then. Yeah, I'll make sure it doesn't come up before noon. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. No, we don't have to. Then we could email you if something weird happened, too. Yeah, so right. Right. There's something yeah. weird. Yeah. Send a runner. Yeah, Just send a runner. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's usually the young one. He's just across the street, that's right. Yeah. Okay, with that, I would uh, seek approval of the agenda, committed agenda. Moved by Councilor Isaac. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Um, I am going to hand it over to Liz Watson. Liz, if you do a two-second introduction of yourself, <coughs> it's all yours. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all, having had a chance to chat with each of you beforehand. So uh, uh, nice. And those that I only spoke with on the phone, nice to meet you in person. So um, as we talked about, uh, Mayor, my, my background, I'm a lawyer and work exclusively in the area of governance. So I work with governing bodies of different kinds of organizations. And I have experience uh, in the private sector and also in the public sector, having worked um, in the provincial government setting for four years around governance, boards of directors, governing bodies, and that kinds of thing. So I'm actually very excited about our session this morning. And because uh, we're going to talk about governance. and. Um, I know that you have had some of your orientation around sort of the formal rules and responsibilities, what's in the statute, what you are technically required to do and how to do it and those kinds of things. But what I want to talk about in terms of governance is really how do you practice effective governance. And so we're going to touch a bit on what you do, but it's really going to be broad strokes. And it's not going to, this is not a technical discussion. The, the real objective is um, how can you be the most effective counselors individually and counsel as a group over the term of your service, over the three-year term? And the reason I'm excited is that I think it's actually very progressive that you have decided to take this approach in terms of having this kind of discussion at the beginning of your term. I also think it's in keeping with what I see happening across the country and indeed around the world. And while I would say that Victoria may not currently have a lot of written guidelines and procedures about how, how you will act, lots of guidance around what you must do and procedure and protocol and all, all those kinds of things, what I'm seeing around the world is councils like you engaging in governance reviews, governance discussions, the development of guidelines to help create an ongoing culture of how, how we will behave, uh, how we will work together. And there's even, um, I don't know if any of you have been to this or, or heard of it, there's now Municipal Counselors College. Uh, actually, has anyone been to it? No. We're all going next month. The one in Toronto with Chris no, Park? No, no, this is UBCM. Orientation. UBCM, yeah. So there's actually, um, you know, the big real <coughs> focus on corporate governance that's happened over the last 10, 12 years since, since Enron, basically. Um, governance, you know, you never used to, no one ever used to really talk about governance. It's kind of horrible and boring and all of that kind of thing. And then since Enron and all the big blow up in the private sector, you can read and hear about governance. Even the National Enquirer 
has articles about governance and you know what were those governing governing bodies doing and things like that. So it's become a much more common world. And since that time, there have developed huge amount of education and training around governance. So certainly in the corporate sector, we see that. And one of the uh, there's two main sort of corporate courses on governance in Canada. One uh, is sponsored by the conference board. And the person who leads that course, um, and it's like 20 days course, um, has also started up like a five-day counselor's governance course. And I'm not sure how popular or populated it is, but I think it's a sign of things to come where people want to bring more focus to these kinds of things. So I just wanted to say that, to say that what you're doing here is actually, I think, progressive and in keeping kind of where the sector of municipal governance is sort of across the country in North America. And the other place that I always look to see what's happening is Australia because they are very progressive in governance generally and in public sector governance they're very well developed. Um, so their public offices um, do a lot of work to provide guidance to different levels of uh, government and government related entities on good governance. And so if you look to those sources as well, you will see quite a bit of thoughtful information about these kinds of things. So that was just a little uh, by way of intro. So as I said, what we want to do talk about today is not about the technical things. So I think you've been learning about that um, for the new people and, and reviewing that for, for the people who are returning counselors. But it's really to discuss um, aspects of the role that might present challenges from a governance perspective. Uh, we'd like to explore your expectations in terms of how you would like to work together over the next three years and identify any opportunities to improve your current governance processes. Or you might say, hey, there's areas where I think there's not a lot of guidance currently and it would be useful if we had something that was a bit more permanent guidance. And so you might come out of that or, um, you know, during the meeting say, I think we should think about having something like this or that. So what I will say is that this session will be much more interesting, useful, if you participate and put your ideas forward. Because that way we can, you can sort of develop a common understanding of what you want to do. So if you had to listen to me for four hours, that won't be so fun. Uh, so I really do encourage you to participate. Um, I put a bit of an agenda together. Just to start, so I'm going to just go over some governance basics, roles and responsibilities, expectations, opportunities. And then we're going to have a little bit of wrap up to say, okay, what did we like out of this? What was useful? Are there anything that you would like to do as a council in terms of next steps vis a vis governance? So, anything else? Is there any, um, anything else specific that you think? Uh, either based on my conversations or just the short outline I've given so far that you want to make sure we cover. Okay, so if as we're going along there's things that uh, we haven't covered and you want to talk about them, then by all means, uh, as I said, just stick up your hand. I will tell you, I don't hear out of this year, so for people on this side, um, I w it'll probably be fine, but if I, I'm not ignoring you if something happens. If it's on this side, I probably am ignoring you, but this <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you had a question? It's just in terms of how we were structuring this. Um, the council has been provided a table of some suggested recommendations from the staff related to the governance model. If we get into sort of a detailed discussion about suggestions this morning, we might just want to uh, bookmark those and bring them back in the afternoon, and we can continue on with that discussion. Okay. So we're we're uh, aiming to go to 1 o'clock. I thought we'd have a break around 10.30. <coughs> Sometimes to get carried away in these things, so um, I'm pretty sure I'll keep on time, but you might need to give me an edge. Well, so, uh, and just, you know, <clears throat> yeah. my feeling on this, and I'm one of nine, um, is carried away is okay. Uh, I mean, if we're working through, so let's not be slavishly we be slavish, to. No. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Good. We'd rather have good discussion than on time discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what is governance? So, um, I had to try and explore this issue myself, even though it's really all I do. What does it mean? It's really um, good governance helps organizations perform better. So I think that if you have a good governance 
framework, if you approach the work of governance well, then the council will work well together and the city will perform better. That's really the goal of it all. So it is governance. So we have, um, you know, a very high level definition here. Governance is really what are the rules of the game that allow bodies of people to work together, to have good discussions about the right things, to make decisions in a robust, sensible way. It's almost like the rules of a soccer game. And if everybody kind of knows their part, you're much more likely to advance the ball down the field than if you're all just running around doing your old thing and kicking it now and again and <laughs> headbutting it and getting fouled and what have you. So it's really the framework um, composed of structure. So the structure is set out for you in legislation and you've got a council and a mayor and councillors and there's a, a certain high level kind of job description that's set out in those things, but it's very high level. Good governance would put a little meat on those bones and help you have a good feel of how you exercise your role in that. The structure also includes your committee structure. And um, I, it sounds like, well, I know it, you, you sort of revamp your approach to committees. Um, but it's your committee structure and what goes to committee and how do things that go to committee come to the council. And then there's the practices. How do you do your work? Well, how do you plan a strategy? Well, we have strategy sessions and here's what we do and here's the type time of year we do it. And that's so everybody can plan and bring it forward and you're doing your individual role as a counselor and you know where I fit in the process, where my job, uh, where I can have the most impact where I work as a team, where I work individually, how I pull it together. And so um, good governance today has evolved in terms of the types of things that governing bodies are expected to be on top of, if you will. And the governance framework has evolved to outline those kinds of things more particularly. So for example, and we'll talk about this a bit later today, that governing bodies, you look at strategy, policy, how will the city operate in achieving its goals, um, how will it do all of its work in a way that is an acceptable standard as set by the council, um, how will you deal with risk management, you know, you've got assets that you manage, you've got long-term financial plans, um, how do you review that in a methodical, effective way, how do you satisfy yourselves that you're exercising your responsibilities to ensure that the city is financially sound and will be financially sound over the next 10, 20, 50 years. How do you do that? Do you know how you do that? Well, governance kind of tells you this is the framework that we've set up so that we know we have a robust process to whether it's reviewing financial performance and financial projections, um, whether it's reviewing our asset plan, whatever it is it tells you this is how we know we're exercising all, res all of our responsibilities. So a good um, governance framework uh, tells you how you do all this work and makes you feel comfortable that you are indeed all the addressing all of the important things. So sometimes uh, people get a bit hung up on the word governance. At our office we say it's not a four letter word, but um, it's really important to have that kind of framework. So if we do it at a very high level, you know, how do we set the strategic direction for the city of Victoria? That's a, you know, that's a big job. How do we develop policies to guide the operations? And how do we ensure our accountability to the citizens? And we'll talk a little bit about what ac accountability um, entails, but obviously there's a lot of responsibility there. If we have good governance structure, that will make it clear uh, who's in charge of what. This is a bit of who gets to decide what. So can I, as an individual counselor, go and decide something or tell a staff member to do something? No, that's not the rules. The rules of good governance, uh, the council's in charge of certain things. That's why we have to have resolutions, etc. cetera. So you've, you've got that good structure set out. Who sets the direction? Is it council? Is it the mayor? Is it city, the city manager? These things are very clear 
in the statute with regard to certain uh, responsibilities and activities that are set out there. What becomes more troublesome is on a day-to-day -day issue. Now, who gets to make that decision? Does that have to go to council? Is that something the mayor can just talk to the city manager about and deal with? There will be issues, I'm sure there have been issues that come up where it's not that clear and somebody jumps in and makes a decision and the other person thinks, why did they do that? That wasn't right. Well, the fact is there may be no absolute right or wrong because a lot of this can be great because your statute is very limited in terms of how it assigns responsibilities. And it's very specific to a certain degree, but there are lots of gray areas. So it's important that the structure, that you make it clear. And this is why you will see that uh, the <coughs> trends around good governance are to put more meat on these bones and to have a bit more explanation of who makes what kinds of directions, how accountability is done, who what kinds of decisions can be handled by this person or that body or what have you. So the structure m makes it all very clear, sort of how all these um, things get done. And, and governance generally is um, authority from the top. So council, you have ultimate authority for everything. And um, in some respects, you know, you could do the whole work. If there were no employees, you know, you could do the whole work of the city. Well, that doesn't make sense at all. Not efficient. Not really the way it's set out in your statute. So you delegate, right? You delegate the majority of your work and carrying out your work to the city manager. And often where there's gray areas is what is a governing role that the council <coughs> decides and what is a managing role that is delegated to the city manager. And yes, again, you've got roles and responsibilities set out in the charter so to a certain degree. Um, you have a little bit more meat on that bones, but there are areas that come up. So good governance means that you should be very clear about these things. So if during the course of your three years working together, you decide, you know what, this is an area that I just don't think is really clear and it causes us problems and my interpretation <coughs> is different than mine, um, than the other person's. These are areas that you want to identify and say, we should bring some greater clarity to that. Because for the long term, you will help future councils because not everybody's gonna have to sort it out from scratch every time. And so that's again, a tenet of good, co of good governance is to try and sort of record and create a culture of how, how you work together. This is not to, impose limits and restrictions on people. It's really just to create a culture of good, healthy functioning that you can build on and every council can build on uh, as the years go forward. So, the, so we had the structure, how are things set up, roles and responsibilities, and then the processes uh, that we talked about. Strategic planning, how do we evaluate the city manager? What's the process that we go through? Who do we consult? What time of year do we do it? against what do we um, evaluate her? Who gets the feedback? What do we do with that feedback? Who delivers it to her? What does she do when she gets it? You know, is that all set up? That's a classic example of good governance practice where there's guidance, the council has put their minds to all of these <coughs> kinds of issues and decided how that will work. And these are the same kinds of things, areas, that uh, governance frameworks will often articulate in writing. So it's not uncommon to see a, what I would call a council policy. So this is not a city of Victoria policy. You know, um, our staff will respond to customer inquiries within 48 hours or one week or whatever the level is. It is, this is a council, this is how we will operate. And, and it's more common to see that kind of uh, more granularity around the direction of this is how we'll, this is how we do things. Now you have quite a uh, more detailed processes set out in terms of how decisions get made and come through committee and go to council and motions and all of that. So this one I'm not as um, concerned around because you do have very clear uh, process around that. These areas I would call sort of more emerging and they're more um, sort of the, the, the oversight responsibilities of the council. 
um, and, and even areas like this, interaction with the community, I will see policies that have been developed in different municipal settings where there is more, the council talks about, okay, how do we think is the healthiest way for us as a group, for us individually um, to deal with members of the community so that we have a common understanding of how we will behave. Because what can happen, as I said earlier, is if everybody doesn't have sort of a common understanding, common standards as to how we think <coughs> we should behave and will behave, what will happen is Councillor A will go off and do something and that will be really irritating to Councillor B, C and D. And then you've got annoyance. And then you've got disrespect. And then you've got all these things, all these layers and lenses that get in the way of you guys working well together. However, if you talk about these are sort of broad standards of how I think we should address these things, broad ways of how we should behave, and you all agree on it, and there's kind of, it's not overly prescriptive, but it gives some guidelines, and people do that, then you say, okay, you know, we're all doing it, we're all kind of operating by the same rules. So probably there are those of you, uh, particularly when you're new, if there's nothing that is written down on this kind of soft side of governing, you may be either A, not sure what to do, or B, you go and do things because you think it's the right thing, but other people around the table think that's a really dumb thing. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, so that's all I'm saying is that what I didn't see when I looked at the documentation here was a bit of this kind of softer, here, here's how you do the, here's how you can do the job well, and here's kind of what, what former councils have thought about uh, how, to, how to do these things. And culture in an organization, as you know, you set the tone at the top. And so even when you think about how you're going to behave and carry out your work, you reflect, what, what you do reflects on the city, obviously. And that's another thing that we have to talk about in terms of governance. As the governing body, you do set the tone at the top. If you work well and constructively, which doesn't mean you all have to have the same ideas, it doesn't mean you all have to agree on everything. In fact, we don't want groupthink. You want people to be really free to have good debate and bring different perspectives to the table. That's an underlying tenet of good governance, is that you, you can do that. Um, but we do want you to work constructively together. And at the end of the day, sometimes you'll have to agree to disagree on a substantive policy thing, but we want you to work well together and to agree on the importance of coming to a decision and moving forward. So these are all the kinds of things that we want to have in place. So why is governance important? Right, are we doing it just for the sake of it? No, I've touched on a bit of it, that I think if we have good systems, good processes, a good culture, and some guidelines around that, then it will help us work constructively together, which is of number one importance. I think it also creates trust and that we you know among the team we've already <coughs> talked about that but also between council and the city manager um, and with staff it also uh, creates trust externally because when people look and they say oh there's a group that's got their act together um, they they work well they've got some uh, common uh, sort of practice guidelines as to how they do their work and by the way, look at, I can see, if I look on the website, I can see all the things that the council does. This is how they are accountable to us citizens. They listen to us. This is how they do it. They report to us. This is how they do it. These are the kinds of things that I think you could actually develop that aren't in place right now, that you could develop and put on your <coughs> website that would help your community understand how you do your work. Um, it would give them insight to, to how you do it because you are you have to behave in a certain way. You can't just go and do any old thing once you're a counselor. You have a huge responsibility at this point in time. And, um, and people uh, want to know how you do your work. And if they um, are able to see that, then um, they have a much better understanding of why you're doing, why you're behaving in a certain way because you, you set that out. So some, um, 
some councils, I don't know that I've seen any locally, but I can't say that I've checked them all locally either, so there could be. Um, some councils will put up, you know, here's our guidelines about how we interact with citizens. And kind of here's what we do and here's what we don't do. And if you want to interact with us, then these are kind of the rules for you too. And they set that out. And it doesn't say you can't meet. It just says, if you're going to meet, here's some, here's the general guidelines. So you know and you know, and it's a fair playing field. Because really, it's about fairness, transparency, openness. Of course, because when you're elected, um, you probably run on, you know, expressing certain views, whether it's around substantive issues of, you know, more parks, more development, whatever it is. We should paint the paint the roads green, whatever it is, and people elect you. And so you rightfully think, well, there's a lot of people out there that agree with the things I was saying during the election. However, as you know, once you get here, you're here for everybody. For those people who wanted the green roads and the people who maybe don't want the green roads. And now you're here, you have to have a fair and transparent way of understanding everybody. Now, some people, and we're going to talk about this, the Green Road Co Coalition is going to be knocking on your door and wanting to go, 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 councillor, and let's get these roads painted green. But your role changes when you're here. You have to listen to the Green Road people, the Red Road people, the Yellow Road people, and everybody in a fair and transparent way. Not only do it in a fair and transparent way, but be seen to do it in a fair and transparent way. So right now, are there any guidelines about how you do that? Are there? No, I don't think so. So these are the kinds of things that you <coughs> kind of learn on the go, and you can help yourselves and teach your councils and the community by saying, this is how we do it. We, uh, you know, we listen to the greens and the yellows and the blues, and, um, and, and this is kind of how we do it. Just so, so just so you know, Liz, yeah. uh, we paint the roads green for priority for bicycles. So. Okay, oh really? <laughs> I'm actually in favor of bicycles. <laughs> just a lobby. There's a lot of people in meet. Vancouver, it's, as, you can, as you may have heard, it's a very controversial issue, but I, I'm, I happen to be on side with it. Um, anyway, so I also think that good governance assists in recruiting the best <coughs> and brightest people to work for you, because um, I've worked and seen I would say more in the corporate setting than here, where you've got a highly dysfunctional group. Nobody wants to work with you. It's no fun. Um, it's unproductive. People are, are, you know, people take jobs because they want to make a difference. They want to add value. And if they fail, they can't do it because the environment is dysfunctional. Um, it's not organized. <laughs> Governance is really about we're organized, we're focused, we're on the top of our game, we're efficient know what we're doing, we get things done, this is how we do it, the framework kind of tells us how we do it, and we really, you know, make a difference. That's what good governance does for you. So, you want to get great people as well. I'm going to pause here, I've been talking a lot. Is it's resonating, makes sense? Any questions about governance generally, the, the, the term or anything like that? Marianne? I don't disagree with anything you're saying, and I think your motivations are great, but I would just add the caution of making sure that in any system that we construct or reconstruct, that there's always the option for adaptability and flexibility and individuality, oh, yeah. because we, we have had discussions previously around setting up sort of guidelines for how we interact with people, but everybody does it a little differently. Yeah. And so just the caution that that, that yeah. ability to do it the way it works best for you and whoever you're meeting with is always there and yeah. always okay. And I think uh, it doesn't, that's, and that's exactly it. I don't think that you want to be prescriptive down to the detail, but I think you want to have a little bit more of, could be principles, right? The principles and values, like fairness I talked about. How you, hopefully you will interpret fairness within a band, how you actually carry it out, but there may be other aspects of it. So. Here is my summation of good governance, which is um, 
ideally, your you, you sort of the sum is greater than the individuals, or you can be a really incompetent group of competent individuals. <laughs> so governance is really about how you work together well, how you advance the interests of the city over the long term. Um, yeah. So uh, again, when I look at bodies that I think are high performing, what are the common characteristics that we see? Clear roles and responsibilities. And again, you have this at a high level in legislation um, and one level down, but perhaps not as much. There may be an opportunity to have a bit more um, guideline or discussion around that for your own working purposes. Committees, again, you've got the technical written guidelines that we were talking about. This is how we do uh, risk management. This is, how the council, this is how the council ensures that the city has an effective approach to managing risks, whether it's earthquakes and natural disasters, whether it's technology crashes, whether it's um, <coughs> problems in our rec centers or our public buildings or those kinds of things. This is how we exercise our responsibility to, to know what those risks are and to know that there are systems in place. And we write that down and we make it publicly available so that the public knows it. And then of course we review and update them <coughs> as we figure out. Purpose driven. So really the governing body owns and drives the purpose and strategy. And I understand that you um, do this, you have go through a strategic planning exercise, uh, which I think is great. Um, and the importance of that, I think a huge part of the importance of strategy is alignment. So it's alignment among council members, because even though you have different perspectives coming in here, uh, and you will all bring those to the table, at the end of the day, part of your responsibility is to together try and determine what's best for your community on a long-term, forward-looking basis. And so getting that degree of alignment that you can among yourselves, and then of course with your city manager and staff so that everybody's pulling in the same direction obviously makes us most effective. And then always li linking the specific issues that you're called upon to decide comment on, provide direction on, that you can link back and make consistent. Because we've seen organizations, um, we've, de we've seen different political bodies that are sometimes feel like they've lost their way and may not have that sense of purpose and where they're going and they're just decision here, decision there, decision there. And you sort of feel like uh, uh, they don't know where they're going and consequently, there's a lot of wheel spinning and they're not really getting where they need to go. So purpose-driven, help that organization. Strong leadership. Now, you uh, will talk a little bit, uh, of course, about the mayor's role in all of this as uh, the special role that the mayor plays, but I think also that individual council members, everybody has a leadership role here because it's up to all of us whether we work well together. I'm going to suggest that the mayor's got a role, well, he does have a role in managing council meetings, speaking on behalf of council and things like that. I'm going to suggest he has also a role in terms of trying to manage us working well together. So if Liz is constantly late to the meetings, or I'm on my Blackberry, or I'm always having a little sidebar conversation with my neighbor, um, I would expect him to come and talk to me and say, Liz, that's not helping us have productive meetings, and uh, is there a problem? Do we need to have more breaks so that you can go out and check your Blackberry, or can you, instead of talking to your neighbor, talk to all of us? Because this is a team sport. We only make decisions as a team. It's the only time we actually do anything, and so we have to, everyone be engaged in making it a, a positive team sport. So I think that individuals all have to, um, and uh, we ourselves will create the culture. 
So if there are some of us who say, eh, whatever, and we're all like that, we're not going to be very productive. And the mayor, uh, the mayor has no power to make me behave. He can't tell me to be here or not be here or turn my blackberry off. I can sh stub my nose at him. But hopefully all the rest of you as well will all hang up on me and tell me to smarten up. And I should expect that. You know, I've got to be a big kid and, um, and do my part as well. So, if, yeah. Good question. Are there other municipalities that you could point us to that have some of these things in place so we could learn from yeah, them? Yeah, I've been doing a little bit of um, reconnaissance work on that. I think, I think there's work to be, I think there are some opportunities there. I, I found um, sort of a counselor guide uh, in Australia that I think is quite helpful. There, there are actually some publications that have been put together by the, um, it's like whatever the ministry is called that looks after all the municipalities. Um, UBCM, you know, that's another class of pay, pay place. But the one thing I would say is that look to those things. Like a lot of this is good governance basics. And what I would say is you've got to make it your own. In the same way that Marianne is saying, you know, great to have this, but it's got to be individual to each one of us. I, al I would also say, hey, you know, here's the kind of things that you should have. Now, let's make it your own, right? Um, but yes, yes, there are some things. I wouldn't say there's a huge body of this. Like if you look in a corporate setting, I could turn on my computer and I could find 10,000, minimum, 10,000 examples of, you know, how individuals on a governing bo body are expected to behave. Easily, 10,000. If I look for that for municipal councillors, I'm scrambling, I'm doing a lot of research. Yeah. And it is a topical issue. We were contacted by the city of Edmonton about a month ago, <coughs> who's just embarking on a research effort to develop what they call the code of conduct, which really is around the rules for uh, individual and group behavior with the public at meetings, you know, between yourselves. So we're we're sort of following that, and and some municipalities have very complicated codes of conduct. The city of Vancouver has a 15-page code of conduct that covers everything for everybody. Um, I think we're talking more about a relationship, standards type of thing that as a starting point here. So. I think, you know, um, where people get a little nervous when they're counselors, it's like, don't hem me in. I'm here, I'm an individual, don't tell me what I can do and what I can't do. I think that's, I think one has to respect the individuality of people but you're also part of an institution, and the institution is a city that has to act responsibly and show leadership for an entire community. And so I think that there is an approach that you could take. Code of conduct might sound repugnant to some people. It's like, well, you're telling me I, you know, I'm bad, or you know, conflict of interest guidelines. And you'll, I saw in your orientation. I mean, you've got two legal opinions about that. I, I'd like you to get beyond, beyond that and have something that is set out easily in a page <coughs> that you can really, is useful. You know, the nuggets, the five nuggets that will help you when you get that phone call saying, you know, hey, meet me on the corner and I got a brown envelope for you. Oh, I think you don't own it. Be careful on that one. But you know what I mean? It's just that those kind of nuggets. And, uh, <laughs> and you say, well, how much is in there first before I decide whether? I'm going to go for it or not. Um, <laughs> well, I could have some important documents. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Leung. But yeah, it's a good question. And uh, there are some examples, but it's not, um, it's a growing area. That's what, I, that's what my research shows me. It's a growing area where people are starting mm -hmm. to develop these. Great. So it's an opportunity for us to kind of be a leader in that way. It's totally an opportunity for you to be a leader. Great. And I also think there are some councils that have said, well, let's take the corporate model and just plunk it on here. And that's not right either because you're an elected person and as you'll see in here, I said you've got responsibilities as part of a team and there's a lot of that that's very similar to how a governing body of a corporation or a municipality needs to act and the kinds of things I think that you are expected to do today are um, similar to what we're seeing across organizations, 
but you do have this individual side to it that has to be incorporated and respected in everything you do. Um, so I think one cannot just, you know, I'm a lawyer, and the one thing they always teach us very early on, and I totally agree, is you cannot just take and plunk. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, you really miss something. And also, if you were to decide we want to do something like this, you need to build it. Because part of the benefit of doing it is that you're, ta you're going to talk about, okay, well, how do we want to deal with these things? And some people will come forward with suggestions, and you will talk about it. And as you talk about it, that's when you will actually develop the consensus around how you want to deal with it. So I could just say, here, I'll write it down. These are the five things. Everyone good with that? You wouldn't necessarily build it into your culture the same way. Because you will, as counselors, some change over time. Some are there, and you always have the, the, the corporate history, the culture, and you want to build on that in a positive way. Um, so effective meetings, again, you've got a lot of uh, meeting procedure and things like that. But what I want to say about good governance is having good discussions. So I know Robert's rules of order and all of that kind of thing. Having good, honest, open debate about important things, really important. I think the better the quality of the debate, you're informed, you're focused on the topic, you're thinking big picture and future focused, then the quality of the better the quality of the decisions. And related to that, I think it's really important if you're looking for opinions on this, that when we have debate and discussion with each other in the interest of the collective community, we're willing to be moved from the position that we came with that morning. Right? Yeah. We're willing to shift in response. If Chris says something and I think, wow, interesting, I hadn't thought about that. I don't have to stick to my position because the Green Road people, yeah. you know, so I think that that is so important in, in working as a collective to be moved by what other people say. Yeah. Yeah. You should be um, open. Mm -hmm. You should be open. You should be informed. You, how do you inform yourself? Well, you inform yourself through reports that are provided to you by your staff. You inform yourself by understanding what's going on in your community. And you should retain your own independence. You should never be in the pocket of anybody. Um, and you should be open to listening to the views of others. The more informed, thoughtful, the views of others are more likely you're to be will be open and influenced by them. So ideally, if you can have the kind of conversation that is really constructive and you're contributing um, different perspectives, then it will be healthy. It will actually be more enjoyable. And so when you're having these kinds of discussions around the table, don't always just think about even what your own thoughts are. I mean, you want to put your own thoughts and views forward. But part of how you can make the discussion better and the decision better is, well, what if we thought about it from this perspective? What difference would that make around this decision? So in other words, playing a little bit of a devil's advocate. Your, your job when you have these discussions is to test, you know, there may be assumptions that are underlying the, the recommendations, and so you want to be testing, are those sound, are those appropriate, um, are these decisions in keeping with our overall strategy, our values, um, our values as a city, these kinds of things. But we don't, we want to get away from I think this and I think this and now I'm going to yell louder to try and convince you and I'm going to yell louder and try and convince you and then I'm going to get up in a huff and walk out and get a coffee in the middle of the, just to let everybody know that I'm, I'm not, I don't agree with you. Well, might be fun for people taking pictures but <laughs> not as useful for um, advancing that discussion and that's your job. Your job is to come up with a great decision and so that individual leadership, this is part of it, how you have those discussions and thinking about the debate. So 
I know sometimes it can get tough when there's, um, uh, you know, people that expect you to say certain things and bring certain points forward, and it's not to stop that, but really think about the big picture always. Yeah. Uh, and this is where, for me, I'm finding it difficult with the open government, with the yeah. media wanting to be present in the open discussion that we're having in mean, the political body at the council. It's, there's a lot of political things that are said for the political side, yeah. and it doesn't encourage frank debate and frank, there's no stupid questions, and frank, let's just, um, s let's just discuss this and hear what everybody has to say. It's much more politically driven. How I do you work with that? I actually think that if you started having your approach to decision making, your approach to debate written down and published on the front page of your website, uh, maybe not, maybe you're not going to get the front page, okay? <laughs> you get those green parkways and things. But if you have a section that is devoted, because you do, I know you've got kind of mayor and council and committees and things like that. But if you also published, here's our approach to governance. This is how, this is what we're trying to accomplish during our meetings and debates. We're trying to analyze issues from all the perspectives in the community. And so as an individual counselor, individ the role of an individual counselor is to bring forward the views of the community as they see it and to test the recommendations um, from various perspectives. So in other words, you start to create that as a norm and you start to tell people, this is how we try and do our work. Now, I may not have the language exactly right, but I think that if you create that culture, then, um, you know, and you could say right in it. And counselors are encouraged to ask stupid questions. <laughs> and we could also, we could also talk about how you frame a question that you might think is a stupid question and how you frame it so it's not actually sounding like a stupid question, <laughs> right? And so I, I just think that there's, the object should be to have this good debate and if you feel that the venue and the way it's set up and the openness somehow inhibits it, which is true. Everybody is concerned about that always. Um, then let's think about how you can work within that to a certain degree. And I do think that setting expectations of the public or letting them know the expectations of how people will behave will start to put in place a better understanding of what your role is. Because usually what I would say this is, okay, these are all my nuggets, you're getting it all here. Um, I don't, it's not that being a governor and being a counselor, doing this job, um, I don't want to say this quite the wrong way, but it's, it's not rocket science in terms of what you have to do. It's challenging because it's judgment, it takes courage, so it's a very challenging job in that, so I'm not diminishing it. It's a very important and challenging job, but the process is not rocket science, but the practice is not intuitive. And so, you know, can I ask that question? Is that appropriate? Am I supposed to ask the city manager that before the meeting or in the meeting? Or can we give this direction or not? And I know there's a lot of legal and you've got administrative policies that, that deal with a lot of that, but there's a lot of kind of how do we do this so it works well. And, um, you know, obviously the, the, the more you establish that culture. But the average person um, who has not been engaged in a high profile, large governing entity as a governor doesn't always understand how these things work. And I would suggest that there are many, many members of uh, internally and externally. The public, I mean, I do, I do this work all across the country, some internationally. I talk to people about this every single day. I talk to people that are very, very smart in what they do. They're professionals, they're executives, they're community leaders, whatever. Unless they've been here and done this, they don't necessarily understand how this all works. And so people looking at you 
are not familiar with really how boards or governors are effective. And so the more you can do to help them set that culture, have them be able to understand it, the easier it will be. But it is, I mean, it's a real, uh, I think it's a real issue for, for, for everybody. Yeah. But isn't one of the issues also that governance is evolutionary? And yeah. so what we explained last year <laughs> as the governing role has changed, and it will change again next year. And trying to exp uh, explain that reality becomes more difficult because it is, and it, and it is also issue dependent. So some issues are very simple, perhaps, and can be dealt with in a consistent way, in a consistent manner over time. Others can't. <coughs> and so that's part of the evolutionary role that's also very difficult to explain, even internally. <coughs> yeah. Well, I think a couple things on that. One is if you don't start to put something yeah. down, you have no <coughs> starting place to, yeah. to review and change. So whenever you have governance guidelines or anything like that, you want to get them in place, you want to work with them, and you want to review them. And review, how are we working within this? How is this system? You know, you have a counselor inquiry system that you put in to help manage inquiries from the public. How is that working? You know, from your perspective, from staff's perspective, what's the feedback we're getting from the public? What do we know about this? Um, the, the systems that you put in place. So. I agree with you to a certain respect that it's always evolving. I think we should always talk about it because at the, bottom, at the end of the day, it's all about people. It's about how you're going to work together and be effective and do something on behalf of the city to, to really move it forward over your term here. And so there are a lot of basics that I would suggest are not, they're not going to change this year or next year. You might decide, hey, our guideline that we had on this is a bit too restrictive or not, it doesn't really deal with these things that it seems over the last year have caused us some sort of extra kind of discussion and I think if we expanded that a bit that would be helpful. I agree with that. Um, it may be that there have been developments in how municipal councils deal with certain issues and we should expand our policies in that area. I agree that will change. But I think there's some basic things that uh, you could really educate people around and that would be helpful. Um, a parking lot. People yeah. Going. Parking lot. Yeah. That'd be great. What have we got on here? Mm -hmm. uh, a couple. Uh, you talked about the mayor and responsibility to address individual counselors. Yeah. Uh, question: Is there agreement on that? Secondly, what about the mayor? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're talk about place, that. Right? Uh, so I just want to make sure that we don't lose that. Um, sort of expectations, right? Yeah, we need to, when we talk about role responsibilities, we, uh, uh, we talk about that uh, liaison position. So again, oh, yeah. just agreement on what that really means. Uh, you know, it's that old sort of, you know, are we, are we your representative in Ottawa, or are we Ottawa's representative? I mean, those sort of questions. Uh, as we move to more open government and perhaps even web streaming stuff, um, the specific I have is media training for council meetings. What I mean by that is, how can you have, you want to have fair, open, and uh, uh, good discussion, but um, as you know, how you say something, even in the morning over the breakfast table, can have uh, changes, results, and, and, and so it's just that understanding of, of, of how, to, how to say something. So we're not saying don't say it, we're saying, is there a better way to say it? And, and those are just discussions. That, it's almost yeah. like Jeopardy. If you frame it, it always seems nicer if you put in the form of a question. I think that you should actually talk about, it would be interesting, I mean, some of you have been around, um, you know, longer, and some of you are, are brand new and just going through orientation right now. I think it would be very good for you to reflect at some point on what kind of training you have had and what kind of additional training would be helpful. The trend around education, again, is that we are much more conscious of the need to help people be good at their roles. And so in the past, we sort of took the approach, well, you're elected, you're appointed, honey, so good luck. Out you go. You'll figure it out. You're smart. And today we're saying, you know what, it's actually quite complex, all the things that we have to do and how we have to do it. And so we want to make sure that we can help support people and get them up to speed and effective as soon as possible. And how will we do that? And so you have orientation. 
but I think that's a classic area. I would, you know, that's another thing I'd stick up on the website. This is this is what we do, and we help people do this. And as you're doing it, to say what other training um, <coughs> would be helpful. And and I do, you know, I also think one of the trends we're seeing is much more training around the financial literacy mm -hmm. as well. And you're just talking about sort of meeting effectiveness and and how to how to phrase. Um, how to ask questions. Well, I mean, yeah, well, one of the realities of Victoria is that we, um, for lack of a better term, punch above our weight. Um, we get way more media attention than a city of 70 or 80,000 people should get. Right. Uh, and that's just comes from the capital city. It comes from the fact yeah. that there's a whole lot of media here, and when the legislature starts sitting, they're just looking for stories. Yeah. Both a bonus and a, and a con. Um, interaction with community, I think one of the things we need to look at is the civic we just need a presentation on what is our civic engagement strategy. We have one and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then, um, and, and then a discussion, because you say, you know, we, we need strong leadership. A discussion of what does leadership look like? Because I think there's different things. I mean, there's the one email guy said, what are you asking me about my garbage for? You know, you got elected to make a decision, make it. Mm -hmm. You know, is that leadership? Or, or is you know, so, you know, so we can all agree that you want strong leadership. Okay, great. But if you don't know what leadership means, then you have different. And so we need a, our own sort of yeah, understanding yeah. what leadership is. Well, so this that, is, this, that is a like the garbage thing is exactly where I think you need to decide what's our approach. You know, when Mr. Jones calls because garbage hasn't been picked up, what's my job? My yeah, job. do I go get the garbage for him? No. Yeah, exactly. And so, but these are also the kinds of things that you need to educate. The public on as well, so that that it's public in terms of here's how we think we deal with these things, and we our job is to say uh, we set the standards of behavior um, and service levels for the city. That's our lever around the garbage pickup. What are we parking these ideas until? What are we parking them until? Well, a, a number of these things we're going to talk about already. They're already on our agenda. Just some of them I think are very important. Yeah, so we've got them uh, up on there and we'll make sure we talk about them. So today we may not resolve. We're not going to sit down and say, well, what is our strategy around that? But we might say, we should do this. So let's park it and we might say, you might all say at the end of this, you know what, we should spend some more time talking about these things and how we might move it forward. And so, you know, at the end of this, you might say, let's, Let's do that, and these are the important things that I think we should tackle. Yeah. Could we just add timing? Just because I find this is two months too late for me. I mean, it's great. It's never too late. Timing of orientation. But it, I think that, yes, I think it's critical to team building and creating a well-functioning group. I think a lot of pitfalls or holes could have, I could argue, have been fallen into too premature. Yeah. And so timing would be. Uh, Granted, that might be moving the whole election Time well, to let's keep making our list as yeah. we go through the day in the morning. The let's flip make our side team. might be that without us having had the experience in a few meetings. But I, I'm of two minds. Yeah, on the one hand, this That's could have been useful point. as our very first order of business, but then we wouldn't have had a way of, of seeing how council was already functioning. Right. I, think you, I think you're actually both right. I think that orientation is not a two days here and then you're done. Mm -hmm. You've got to, and I think Chris, you made that point in our discussions as well. Is that it has to be ongoing because, first of all, you don't ingest everything you're told in three days or five days. I don't know how many days you have. You probably have a lot of days, but you know, you could have ten days, let's say, of, of orientation because you've got a lot to cover. You're covering substantive issues that are current in the city for new people, getting up to speed on all of that. Um, you know, the process, the people, the this or that, and the other relationships with other levels of government, and blah blah blah. You know, it's like boom and can't believe that you take it all in. But you, you need to start somewhere, And but it may be over time. So yeah. immediate, ongoing, because now I've got the experience, so now I'm six months later, and now we're gonna have another session on this. But I think the important point that you're saying is that the orientation and ongoing orientation program for counselors is important. And what you should decide is, what are the important aspects of it? And have we got it covered in our current program? And are there areas that we can improve our program? Because uh, then you can say, okay, 
And then you can have your little orientation policy that says, these are all the things we do, this is when we do them, and then after every new cohort of new counselors comes into, you can go through it again, you can check in and say, how's, how's that working? And, and then you're not starting from scratch every time. So, very good. Yeah, thanks, Dean, for getting kind of the, um, for getting the, that parking lot going. So I think during the morning, as there's other things that pop into your mind, let's just park them up there. Um, constructive re relationship, really important. I think while you are ultimately um, at the top of the hierarchy, no, when we've got that, uh, there you are, sort of balanced on the top. And your city managers down here. Um, I think of it as shared leadership, because your city manager uh, runs this place 24/7 and does so under the guidance of the policies that are set by council. But the city manager cannot do a good job unless you guys are functioning well. And you cannot do a good job unless the city manager is functioning well, bringing you the information you need, making sure that everything is being carried out how you want, helping you with recommendations, looking at, you know, doing the research, doing the broad um, context for you looking at making decisions, helping with all of the things. So it's really important that there be a constructive relationship. And that's why we have evaluation is not just about you uh, telling the city manager whether he or she, you think they've done a good job. It's to provide a venue for you to have a good discussion about aligning expectations and making sure that you're working well together. So really important even throughout the year. You know, the city manager's not a slave that you just like pump, pump, pump. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, even in the, the charter, of course, the city manager's got responsibilities and there's a balance and there's a relationship. And again, how do we work constructively? What are the kinds of things that we want to make sure are in place so that we know that it is? Positive culture and dynamics. That's sort of what we've been talking about in terms of setting the norms and standards of how we'll behave in meetings, how we'll behave in doing our job. Um, ethics and conflicts of interest are areas that um, I see this um, more so on the council areas around conflict of interest policies and a little more guidance around that. So, new expectations and trends. What are we seeing? We are seeing much more uh, written policies, so we're having this reduced to writing. Um, the code of conduct, as someone said, declaration of values and principles. Kind of a nicer way to put it, um, but it's really around how we'll behave. What's our common understanding of how we'll behave? How do we approach strategy? So, uh, we see organizations much more involved in that, and you know, what you don't want to be as a council is like, well, here's an issue, oh, here's an issue, here's an issue, and we're kind of, you know, we're not really, we have limited resources, we have a lot of demands from the public, we have things that we want to achieve and a vision, and we need to be very focused, proactive, and productive in terms of driving that forward. And so we see governing bodies like this spending much more time to get that piece done and done well, and then the other work falls within that. Risk management, we see now that this is listed as a specific responsibility of governing bodies. How do we do it? What does it encompass? Who's responsible for what? Um, evaluation of the chief executive, again, a much it's hard to believe. Now, public sector in this area, I think, has been better than private sector historically. Now, the private sector's, you know, definitely very good at this, the, the more progressive organizations, uh, for sure. But making sure that this is done well, it's thoughtful, it's useful. Succession planning. Your job is to make sure that this city has good leadership today and five years from now and ten years from now. So. 
governing bodies are being much more purposeful about what they talk about in the area of leadership. Understanding what will our leadership needs be in five years. That's going to flow right out of our strategy. If we are going to be the high tech capital of the world, then that's a baseline and our leaders are going to be, need to be very, very savvy about these things. And so when we're thinking, so we're constantly annually thinking about what are the future leadership needs? And then we're saying, what do we need to do to ensure that we have those leaders in place? It's planning for succession. What if our city manager decides to take a permanent vacation at the spa and doesn't come back? Um, <laughs> I don't know if you were going or you'd already been, but um, you know, I did a session uh, with an organization, and the chief executive uh, didn't show up, and we got a message, or the uh, you know, a message was sent. Well, uh, he was in, an a I think it was, I don't know, some kind of accident. He's broken his leg, and he's at the hospital. And, you know, thankfully it was just a broken leg and it's getting set and all of those kinds of things. But it was a great opportunity, it was right at the beginning of the session, to say, okay, you're here, he's not showing up. He's not coming back tomorrow, he's not showing up. Who's taking over? And I did ask those questions. Okay, who are you pointing right now to take over? And more importantly, why? What are the needs on, of an interim leader? What are the needs of a long-term leader? What are you doing to plan? And that is an area of responsibility. And so in addition to deciding the future of the city and the big projects, you know, the big decisions that you have to make and all of that, you have a real concern today in making sure that we've got good leadership. And what is the city manager doing to ensure that you know, we have the right structure, we've got good development of people. So these are things that governing bodies are much more interested and involved in today than they used to be. And I agree that's extremely important and I, you know, we need to support the city manager in doing that. What I find is interesting is sometimes the public perception of that and I think we need to educate the public the importance of uh, having succession planning as well. You know, because we, we hear too often that, that there's not an understanding of, uh, of yeah, as I said, the importance of it and... I think that the people just don't know. I think a lot of it is people don't know. You know, how is the city manager chosen? Is it political? You know, what's, what's our view? What's our responsibility? How do we, uh, you know, put it in plain English? What's the city manager do? What do we do to ensure that there's good leadership in our city? These are all things that will also help the public understand how you're exercising your responsibilities. For example, there's times when you need to go in camera, right, and you're talking about personnel. Well, some of it's because you're doing a review of the city manager, and that's the way it's done. Um, because you want to be able to have that, that's, that is accepted, that, that when you're dealing with these you know, personal matters, but it has to be done, and it has to be done well. And thinking, now, when you have an approach to succession planning and leadership development. That's something that the city manager um, will develop uh, for your senior leaders, key positions, and that kind of thing. Your job is to make sure that's in place. You're not developing it all. But with respect to the, the very top leadership position, you, know, you have to be thinking about what are the needs and what are we doing to make sure our leaders have that. And that we're bringing up because we know that uh, people who are promoted internally, unless we need a big shake-up, we know that the research tells us that people promoted internally are more successful in the long term than people brought in from the outside. Now, sometimes you have to bring people in from the outside, and we have to balance between we'll do the worldwide search and we'll get the best person, but ideally you want to be planning so that you're developing very competent, capable leaders so that you've got strength in leadership that is going to match the strategy and you're going to keep really pushing forward to achieve those goals.
Um, some of this stuff, as a new councillor, I don't know what's in place and what's not in place. So when this whole process is finished, and now is not the time to go into this, are you going to um, give us some kind of report, or will there be some kind of way to say, okay, do we have a risk management strategy? How is our process, according to your experience, for evaluating the city manager? Do we have succession planning? When does when do those kind of uh, content-based things I think, get shared? I think that what I will do at the end of this is say, here's all the things that could, should be in place. Up mm -hmm. to you to decide whether they should be in place. Mm -hmm. I could say, I think they should be. I'll tell you what I think should yeah. be in place. Let's put it that way. And then I think you can go through this. You might want to, and I'll just plant the seed, that you might want to, um, at the end of this, appoint a bit of a governance working group. Because mm -hmm. I think that governance is an area, when I talk to everybody, um, I actually found all of you very um, interested in having a good working relationship, good governance, working together well, constructively, you know, achieve these things. And um, I also, when I looked at kind of the, you have lots of great policies and frameworks about, um, you know, the function of how this works, but in terms of that softer guidelines around the governance and how you work together, not so many. So I think that there's opportunities there. So you might want to think about having a small uh, working group, you know, maybe it's a mayor and a couple of councillors that pull, take whatever comes out and says maybe uh, let's ask those people to have a bit of a closer look at it and come forward with some recommendations around what we might do. And you could prioritize them. You know, you've got three years here. These are not, this does not have to be done overnight. Um, but there may be some things that you say these are kind of short term, higher priority. These are things that we want to work on over time. You know, maybe we'll do a little bit of a, a research project and we'll pull in what we've got and we'll, yeah. Just interesting, we had the same dis a little discussion at earlier this morning. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be, um, I want to say better? <laughs> to be, if it's a governing discussion, that it's inclusive to whoever wants to participate, rather than picking two or three people yeah. that, and then reporting back. So I a forgot lot of you guys like to work a lot of long hours. Well, no, it could, but at least it's inclusive if people wanted to yeah. participate. They had the opportunity to, yeah. rather than have the, sure. the, the, just a few people discussing and throwing out ideas that might be important to others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, in terms of what goes in any of that, you definitely, everyone would need to be involved. In terms of the process of how to pull it together, yeah, you might want it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so financial literacy, I think this is an area, um, I, I actually think this is an area across all sectors that people need more support on because while we can all have a sense of revenue, expenses, mm -hmm. bottom line, is it black or red, um, it's actually much more complex than that. When these numbers are changing in the middle, what does it really mean is going on within the city? How does this income statement relate to the balance sheet today, five years from now? Do I know the questions that I need to ask to understand how a decision I'm making today reflects on our long-term financial plan. Because your job is all about uh, you know, solid, sustainable city that continues in that way into the future. And that's, that's why you get paid the big dollars to make the big decisions. What are th what's the balance? Are we going to do this this year or this that year? It's not just about, well, this would be great to do. How does it fit in the strategy? How does it fit in our long-range financial planning? If we do this today, we're going to be in serious trouble. You know, think about these countries that have this debt and they're in a complete bind. Your job is to make sure that the city is sound today and will be sound 10 years from now and 50 years from now. So 
part of it is around the policies you put in place in terms of financial management and that and the guidelines of those, but it's also the decisions you make. And I personally feel that unless you are very experienced in the area of financial analysis, um, that it's an area of, you know, I, I put it under the training as well. So I think it's very important that you understand this. And so what we're seeing in terms of trends is that there's much more focus on making sure that people who are in leadership positions have that kind of knowledge. And we see a trend certainly towards the evaluation of the governing body itself. So how are we doing? And um, how could we be better doing what we're doing? Oh, I'm so sorry. I think that might be good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to expect the mayor to take me aside at lunch and, uh, <laughs> oh, there we go. Those okay. things about meeting management you forget to do, it's sort of like, could everybody please put their uh, cell phones and Blackberries on uh, airplane mode, is that the right term? Um, well, wasn't, I, I'm not sure that we've got a lot. Did you want to talk about self Well, just that I find it interesting in, the, for, say, perhaps the Occupy movement, or what happened. Has there been sort of that debrief on what we could have done, done better or what we might do differently or what to, that's reflecting on decisions that were made in something that was quite large in the city? Would you consider that a, a self-reflection? Is that more, is it more individual self-reflection? Okay, well, I think there's a couple things that I would um, come out of that with that question for me. One is, um, how did the city deal with it? Like the city staff, mm -hmm. and I would expect the city manager would want to sort of reflect on yes. that. That would be, you know, when you have any kind of a large out of the ordinary situation, and cities all over mm -hmm. North America had these situations, uh, reflecting on how you did it sort of from an organizational perspective is one if there were aspects of how was the council involved in making decisions, uh, how fast were we in making decisions, how, you know, how did it all work, pulling us together, or whatever, then that would be something, like from a councillor's perspective, I would want to know, do I think as a council, we effectively dealt with that situation in terms of the process of how we made decisions, et cetera, the information we had, the timeliness, et cetera, I would also, if I thought it was important, if the council thought it was important, um, I would also, that if, if the council thought it was important that the city also reflect, you know, you might ask the question of the city manager, um, how, do you, how do you think the city dealt with that? And are you going through any kind of a review? So two, two aspects, how did we deal with it? And I think that governing body, so this was really around reflecting on yourselves, you know, self-reflection, how am I doing as a counselor, that kind of thing, but as a governing body as well, how did we do? Because at the end of the day, you've got to ask yourselves, have we made a positive or negative or nothing difference on the city? Well, as a council, you'd like to walk away saying, here's Here's the positive effect that we had on the city. Well, and we often learn more from our mistakes if we're willing to uh, to look at what our decisions were and go we next reflect and point. to reflect on what our uh, it may and, not be and mistake, you may, but not it mistakes, may be no, but how no, we could from improve. that experience. Yeah. This is what and that, that would be a recommendation to councils yeah. down the road, would it not? Yeah, and I think that again, that's what good governing bodies do much more today is they reflect. Um, what have I? What have we contributed? And have we done a good job of it? And could we be better? Yeah. Um, so financial literacy, I've talked about that. But really, um, I think it's important for governing bodies, obviously. This is a very simplistic, simplistic outline. But it's something that I think is important. Um, and uh, so it would be useful, I think, as part of this, and we've got it up under the training, is just to think about what kind of assistance do you get and what do you think might be necessary. So we're about 25 after 10, probably behind, but we're covering lots of things anyway. Um, how are you good? You want to take a little break? You want to press on? Well, let's have a five-minute break. Five-minute break? Yeah. Okay.